Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. So anyways, listen, I'm going to get down on my knees in just a moment. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. You don't come to hear from a man. You don't come to hear from a woman. Listen, I got nothing to say. I, truly, truth be told, honest, even though I've gone to college and all that stuff, I got nothing that you want to hear. But I know full well that the Holy Spirit has a lot for us to hear and a lot for us to get. And so I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher tonight. And as I do, I'm going to ask if you could stand with me, if you're able to. Let's just join together. And what we're doing is we're preparing our hearts. So I want you to just to take the time to kind of get rid of those thoughts, uh, you know, or, or get your thought process ready. Get your heart ready to receive the Word of God so that it's a seed into good ground in your heart so that we leave this place really impacted by the Word of God that we're going to get into tonight. So, Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, we don't take it for granted that we get to worship. Like Cameron said, Lord, there's nobody coming in our doors ripping us out of here and, 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 and bringing violence to us. So, Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. And we don't, we don't ever come to hear from a man or from a woman, Lord, to fulfill tradition or even for entertainment. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that here at the Rock Church that it's Jesus Christ that's the senior leader of this church. And so it's in the name of Jesus we ask that your Holy Spirit tonight would be our teacher. Lord, I pray that you would be our counselor. Your Holy Spirit would be our guidance to show us and to direct us and to motivate us to, to be what you've called us to be. And Lord, I pray that as we get into your word and we see some of your truths tonight, Lord, I pray that it would be like a, a seed planted into good and fertile ground, the ground of our hearts, that we would walk out of this place, not just to come to church, but to be your church. And so, Father, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. And Lord, we ask that you bless all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Calvary Chapel brothers and sisters and our Catholic brothers and sisters, all the different denominations and the churches tonight that are having services, Harvest and the uh, Water of Life and Lord, uh, Lord Emmanuel Baptist. Lord, we thank you that you would bless them as you have blessed us. Lord, we thank you that we are all brothers and sisters working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, tonight's kind of a fun night. I'm going to start, a, uh, we're going to start a little series looking into uh, some history. Uh, for those of you that know, I talk about it often or frequently. I'm a real history buff. I just, I really like to learn uh, what's gone on in the past. I believe, I truly believe the cliche that if we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And, and, and truth be told, all throughout society, all throughout our lives, all throughout our world, we look to people that have experience hoping to gain what they have gained. You know, you think about men like Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway that, that are investment gurus. We would pay an uh, absorbent amount of monies to sit with a person like that because of their experience to hear their advice or their direction in our life when, uh, when it's so neat for us to have this thing called history to look back on the lives of people that have gone before us and to look at their lives, to look at the, the history, the things that they've experienced and the things that they've gone through that we can learn. Because I believe that there are many lessons for us to learn in life. I tell you, every day of my life is a life lesson. Whether, whether it's smashing my finger and the words that follow is a life lesson on, on peace and on high school words and things I shouldn't say or lessons on just how to be a better father, a better husband, a, a better pastor, how to be a good Christian or whatever it might be. There's so many lessons in the Word of God for us to learn. And I remember looking back a while back, we did a series called Lessons from the Kings and we looked at some of the kings of the Old Testament. And in, in teaching church history in our Bible college, uh, you'll know, is any of my church history students or former students or previous students? All right, all right. So you can see some of them hollered because it's not that bad, okay? Uh, some of them are like, I don't want to admit that I went through your class, but it's okay, it's all right. You'll know that they'll know that one of my favorite seasons in history is, is an age that we would call the apostolic church. The apostolic church is the time when Jesus Christ ascended to the throne and he left his disciples waiting in the upper room until the time John, the last apostle, died uh, somewhere around 100 AD, the, the era of the disciples of the apostles. And the reason is that the church was so infant, it was, it was growing, there wasn't this theology. We talked about the importance of knowing the word of God. They didn't, I mean, you might find this hard to believe, they didn't have Bibles at that time, you know, when we say open up your Bibles, they didn't have that. All they had was the story of a man and they lived their life based on the letters or the story of somebody else. And yet because of these men and the influence that these men had, the, had the world exploded with Christianity. It's just such an exciting era. 
And so I wanted to take a look into this season, into this time, because there's some real pillars in this season of, of men that just change the world. And, and, and I, I wish we could go on and on and on and talk about all of these great apostles and what each one of them did. But really, there's a couple of men that I want to focus on and what we can learn from their lives and, and the messages that we can see through the experiences that they went through and how we can learn through that. So over the next couple of weeks, I'll take you and we'll look at some of these lives. We'll look at the history and, and some of the understanding and we'll look at some of, what the, of the things that went on during that time and pull out the truth of their lives that we can apply. And I believe that when we can look at history, when we can look at what somebody's done behind us and we can realize the application in our own lives, that's when Things like history that could, some, could be a boring subject for some. That's when things like history can really come alive because we understand why it's important to understand or to know what happened. And so today I want to take a look at, and the title will be, uh, the, the series will be called Looking At. Today I want to take a look at one of my favorite, if not, he's got to be my favorite, if you could call him a Bible character. A character kind of makes it sound like a story. My favorite person in history uh, besides Jesus is Peter. Simon Peter. The Apostle Peter, I'll tell you what, if there's anybody in my life that I can relate to, it's this man. There's the greats like Paul, and we're going to look at Paul, and there's the disciple whom Jesus loved, who John refers to that of himself, who, who really he was the man who leaned on the chest of Jesus and had this intimate relationship of a friendship with Jesus. And, and then there's this, this man, Peter. Now, Peter often gets this cliche, he kind of gets this, uh, this reputation in the Bible or, or in church circles as kind of like the outspoken disciple, the, you know, the hot-headed one, and kind of, you know, he was, he was ready at a moment's notice to give his opinion or... You know, uh, he was the one, we'll see, that he chopped off one of the guards' ears uh, after they were coming after Jesus. But there's so much to Peter beyond just Peter being the outspoken one. There's so much to Peter beyond just walking on water. There's so much to Peter's life that I believe we need to understand and lessons that we need to learn beyond just what we know of Peter. And I want to take a look at some, some real critical areas of, of Peter's life and what we can learn. And what we can realize and what we can apply to our lives so that we can learn from his experience because it's there for us to know all about. And so today I want to take a look at this man, Peter, my favorite uh, apostle, certainly my favorite disciple, uh, a man I can relate to uh, just based on growing up. My family was the outspoken family. Pastor Jim, as many of you know, I, I talked about him this week. It's kind of the, I'll tell you like it is. I don't, I don't care how you feel about me. I'm going to be in your face about it. I'll let me love you enough to respect you to truth, uh, tell you the truth. And, and, and Peter, I really can relate to that. I feel like Peter was that way in a lot of times. He was a man that oftentimes rose up to be the, uh, the, the spokesman for the apostles or the disciples. When somebody would ask a question, they would, they would go to Peter to ask the question. I think because of his, his, his ability to speak, his ability to address people, and his lack of fear for opening his mouth. Sometimes we've seen in Peter's life that when he opened his mouth, he would kindly insert his foot in it as well, which is a, a great lesson to learn right there. But today I want to just look at his life. And, and the first time we see Peter in the New Testament is in the book of Matthew in the fourth chapter. Matthew in the fourth chapter tells us that Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee and he sees two brothers, uh, some translations or some books say attending their nets, some say uh, on their boat fishing. And so Matthew the fourth chapter says, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, or Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. And verse number 19, it says that Jesus said to them, uh, this is my favorite statement, uh, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I think that's just such a cool statement uh, to be fishers of men, not fishers of, I, I fish for fish. Uh, I, I would call myself a fisherman. And uh, fish are fun to catch, they are, but there's just nothing better than seeing somebody's life changed because of Jesus Christ. Fishing for men. Now, sometimes people get a little bit rubbed the wrong way. Oh, I don't like it when you refer to, to that as fishing, but I'm just repeating Jesus Christ. So Jesus says to this man, Peter, or Simon, and his brother Andrew, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And the Bible tells us immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Yeah. They dropped everything to follow 
this man. So just, I, just, I just want to take you there because I really think history is a great story. So just go with me. Just, just open up your thinking caps. Let's just go with our imagination. Let's have a little bit of fun tonight thinking and visualizing the story. So here's Jesus, and he, he's walking on the shoreline. You know, like you're walking on the beach in the wet sand, and, and, and the water's just kind of touching his toes. And, and there he sees all these boats, and they're coming in from the end of the day, and they're, they're tending to their nets, and they're making sure that, that everything's good for the next day, washing off all the, the water and all the grime and all the nasty that's on their nest and here's this man and he says hey follow me and I will make you fishers of men now normally a person would be like you're nuts but the Bible tells us they dropped their nets and they followed him what made them so receptive to follow Jesus Peter was a follower of Jesus Things that we can learn from the life of Peter is Peter left everything to follow this man at his beck and call. Jesus tells us in the book of John, my sheep hear my voice and they know. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So what made Peter so receptive to leave everything he has. Here's what we know about Peter based on what the Bible tells us. We know that Peter was born near the Sea of Galilee. We know that Peter owned a home. So we know that if, if he owned a home in Capernaum, that, that means that Peter had some wealth to him. That he wasn't just, you know, a peasant. He wasn't just, Peter was probably middle class or upper, upper middle class to own a home. We know that Peter was married. So that means that he had a family to provide for. So here's a man that's married. Here's a man that owns a business or, or, or has a boat with his brother or a partnership. And here's a man, Jesus, that walks along the side of the seashore and says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And here's a man that leaves everything behind to follow. Why? Because Peter knew his shepherd's voice. Peter knew the voice of God. For you and I, the lesson to be learned is, do we know when God speaks to us. How do we know? Because Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and I know them and they listen when I call. So when God speaks, how do we know? And I really believe the answer comes that the book of John tells us, and I won't take you there, but the book of John tells us that Andrew, Peter's brother, had listened to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, his mission was to tell the whole church, the whole world, that Jesus was coming. And so Andrew heard the teachings of Jesus, and when he heard about Jesus, their heart was open and receptive. And he says to his brother Peter, that's the guy I heard about. Their hearts were open, receptive. Sometimes in our lives we get so busy, we get so wrapped up in jobs, we get so wrapped up in houses, we get so wrapped up in relationships, we get so wrapped up in everything that we're doing in our day-to-day -day business that we miss that still small voice that God has for us. To say, hey, I want to talk. Hey, I want you to follow me. So to take the lesson from Peter to realize that Jesus is our shepherd, and that when he calls, we ought to know his voice. How do we know his voice? By opening our hearts and preparing to receive and being receptive to the voice of God. Because like we saw in the Old Testament, God comes at sometimes the most inconvenient times. God shows up on the scene in the times that we don't expect him to be. And his voice isn't this booming voice like the disciples heard when Jesus was baptized or when Jesus was transfigured on the mount. Oftentimes his voice is a still, small voice that speaks to us in the night, in our times of turmoil, in our times of busyness, and to be able to say, God, I hear you, I'm listening. Here I am to learn from Peter that he knew his shepherd's voice. So Peter goes on and he becomes a follower of Jesus. And, and the Bible goes on and tells us some great stories about Peter, some, some great stories about the miracles and Jesus feeding the 5,000 and Jesus feeding the 4,000. And Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road one day and he and he asks his disciples, I can just imagine Jesus is walking and he, I can just think he's, he's probably walking backwards and he's asking them, hey, who does everybody say that I am? Matthew, the 16th chapter. And the disciples say, well, some, some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say that you're John the Baptist. Some, some people, and they kind of give them what, 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 what the, the, the consensus is on the public of who Jesus is. 
And Jesus asks his disciples in Matthew, the 16th chapter. Jesus asks his disciples, he says, who do you say I am? He asks all of them, who do you say I am? And Peter, the, the spokesman, the preacher, he jumps up and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he goes on and he says in verse number 18, and I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a, that's a founding scripture for us here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Oftentimes we say, well, what is this rock that Jesus is talking about? Sometimes we say, well, it's the revelation that God, Jesus said it wasn't given to you by men. It was the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus says, you know, oftentimes we hear, well, it's the revelation of the Holy Spirit to man that Jesus will build his church. And, and I believe that that's truth. But I believe Jesus, who knew all, who knew what was coming, who was connected to God, was, was, was God incarnate. I believe that Jesus knew how to speak in such a way that he had more than one meaning. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us about the grace of God that it's the manifold grace, meaning multi-sided. That just when we think we know, just when we think we have it mastered, all of a sudden we see another thing. All of a sudden we see another truth. And so here, I believe, is probably one of, if not the high point of Peter's life. I mean, think about it. Imagine with me for a moment. You're with 11 of your best friends, your family, with, uh, and, and add to that anybody else who was following Jesus at the time. And Jesus asks the question, and you got it right. I mean, that's pretty cool. Right there alone. You know, you could see Peter. I could just see Peter kind of like, yeah, man, I did it. You know, chest kind of puffed out. And, and then, and then Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. I could just think of Peter like, yeah. You know, I can just imagine Thomas and Bartholomew and Andrew coming up and just kind of like, man, that was awesome. <laughs> Jesus just said, you're blessed. I just imagine the high point. I can just, as they're walking on the road, you know, everybody's kind of coming up and they, they want to get next to Peter. Dude, that was so cool. Pete, Jesus just said that you're blessed. And, and so Peter, you know, he's kind of, I'm good. I got this. Jesus said he's going to build the rock. On, 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 on Peter. See, oftentimes we think that it's the, the revelation, but I believe that there's more to it. Why? Because the Bible tells us in the book of John, when Andrew introduces Simon, who's Peter's name, to Jesus, Jesus renames him. He gives him a name to what we know today. Peter. Did you know that? Jesus gave Peter his name. And Peter literally means stone or rock. So that's why when Jesus says, you are Peter, Jesus is saying, man, you're a rock and I'm going to build my church on you. I tell you what, that right there would make any person on top of the world. The highest moment I could just see Peter like, oh, I have arrived. But you know, how many times in our lives have we think, and I can think back to my own life, how many times in my own life have I thought, man, I have arrived. I've made it. Praise God. I got beyond that trial. Oh, hallelujah. I am an overcomer. I am the man. You start getting that walk. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. All good. Peter's got the walk. He's arrived. But how many times in our life when we think right then that we've made it, we seem to fall flat on our face. When we think it's all about us, it's the Peter, it's the Simon Bar Jonah show. Dun, 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 dun. And right then, when we think that we've got everything figured out, right then, when we think that we've arrived, right then, when we, I, the, the skies open up, it seems like the moment right after that, we fall on our face. And this is why I say I love Peter so much. Because it seems like every time I think I'm good, every time I think that, that I, I've got it together, every time I think I've figured out the answer, it seems like the very next step I take in life leads me to trip and stumble and fall flat on my face and to know if anything in my life that I'm not alone is comfort to me. Peter, 
right after Jesus exhorts him, right after Jesus says, oh, you are blessed, Peter. They begin to walk and Jesus begins to say, oh, I got to go to Jerusalem and suffer at the hands of others and die. And Peter takes it upon himself because he has arrived to pull Jesus aside. And now the cricket has now become the master. To tell Jesus, far be it from me that that's going to happen. And we see in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse number 20. Go ahead and put it up on the screen, guys. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Okay, Peter tells Jesus that you're not going to die. Far be it from me. And Jesus says to Peter these words. Get behind me, Satan. Okay. He just said he was going to build his church on Peter. And literally, the next sentence. Jesus is rebuking Peter. I have a little video I want to show you. It's, it's a monologue. It's a modern day actor acting as though or reciting as though he was Peter in that moment. And I just want to show you just so we can relate because I really believe there's such an important message for this. So check out the screens. You know what it felt like? Um, it felt like dad strength. You know when you were a kid and you're wrestling with your dad, you know, and he's just taking all the hits and he's toying with you, and then boom, he just takes you down? Jesus setting me straight that day. It, it felt a lot like that. Okay, okay, I know, I know. Hindsight is 2020, but at that time and, and at that moment, I, I, I just couldn't figure out what he was talking about, you know? I mean, why did he have to suffer? Why did he have to die? No, 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 not, not on my watch. This wasn't going to happen. No, sir. It just wasn't like he was, he was thinking straight, you know? I kept thinking maybe he's dehydrated, maybe he's hungry. The man never got enough to eat, if you ask me. So I take him aside and I start get laying into him. And before I could even get very far, he stops me, looks me in the eyes, because he has those eyes. And you know what he said to me? Get behind me, Satan. Dad's strength. Those words, those eyes, that moment floored me. He floored me. <sighs> but I mean, seriously, get behind me, Satan. All right, I admit I have some flaws, you know, but Satan, I mean, that stung a bit, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I just didn't get it. I just didn't see the whole picture, which won't be the last time that'll happen, mind you. <laughs> you see, I, I wanted him to use that, that dad strength on the world, you know? I mean, <sighs> my desires, my plans. And your boy, Peter's plans, they don't always work out so good. I.e. ear slicing, etc. But he knew, he knew all along. <laughs> he would give us just enough rope for allow us to figure things out for ourselves. And then he just, he had that dad strength, you know? He'd pull us back in. Right at that moment, we needed saving from ourselves. That was his plan all along, saving us from ourselves. Saving me from myself. Peter needed to see that beyond the plans of men lay the plans of God. Sometimes in our lives we make plans. We have it all mapped out. Got that five-year plan. Got that 10-year plan. You got that investment portfolio. We say tomorrow we'll go to such and such city and buy and sell and make a profit. But Peter needed to realize in this moment when he took it upon himself to tell Jesus, no, you can't die. No, that's not for you. He needed to realize that beyond or above the plans of men lay the plans of God. Yep. To learn to follow 
God's plan, not his own. I like how Peter says in that video that the actor says, it's not the first time I missed the big picture. The comfort and knowing of Peter's life is that he, Peter was just an ordinary man, a fisherman, a man who owned a home, a man who had a wife like some of us in this place today who have a husband or a wife or live in that American dream. To understand that you've got plans and that's good. That's great. But beyond your plans, lay God's. We've got to learn to follow God's plans, not just our own. Such an amazing thought. Looking at the life of Peter and looking at the story of Peter, much more happens, but I really believe that the most crucial and the most pivotal time in Peter's life happened in a period of 50 days. In a period of 50 days, Peter's life changed dramatically and completely, and this man, even though he had spent three years with Jesus, was never the same after these 50 days. And Jesus, as he has his disciples in the upper room and they're in Jerusalem, and they're celebrating the Passover feast, Jesus does something amazing. He takes his clothes and he, he takes them off and he wraps himself in a, in a towel and a garment and he washes his disciples' feet and he eats dinner with them and he tells them that there's one of them that's going to betray him and he says, even still, you're at my table. And they begin to say, and Peter says in John the 13th chapter, Peter says in John the 13th chapter, he says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I go, you can't go. You can't follow me, but you'll come after. Verse number 37, Peter says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for your sake. Jesus says something to Peter that changes his life, that rocks his world. He says, you'll lay your life down for me, for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you that after the, until the, until the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Jesus tells Peter, something's happening in your life. Something's going to happen and you will deny me. Deny my existence, deny knowing me, whatever it might be. You will deny me three times. And you and I look at that and we read back and we say, man, Peter missed it. The capital sin or crime of Peter's life. To deny his shepherd. And this is a moment, I believe, that changed Peter's life. And there's a, a story I want to show you, yet another video of Jesus telling Peter, and you know the story that Peter does eventually deny Jesus, like Jesus says. And that, that same actor comes back and he recounts the story of Peter's experience in the time that Jesus has died before his resurrection. And I want to just take you back to understand, looking at the life of Peter, what we can look at in our own lives. So I want to just draw your attention to the screen. Check out that video one more time. They say a rooster crowing is God's wake-up call. Yeah, that's, uh, at least that's the way it was for me. Everything, that, that whole night was a blur, all right? Um, I didn't comprehend, none of us could comprehend everything that was going on, all right? We were all in the upper room, Jesus was washing our feet. Um, then we were in the garden, Jesus goes off to pray by himself. I fell asleep. I'm not proud of it. I had a big meal. Bread makes me sleepy. Next thing we know, me, James, and John, Jesus is in our face, and he's trying to wake us up, and uh, he said, um, what is, he said, uh, the, the, uh, the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing, and, and then before we know it, Judas is kissing Jesus on the cheek. I try to go help him. I cut off this guard's ear. For the record, I wasn't aiming for his ear. I'm a fisherman, not a swordsman. And then they, uh, they arrest Jesus, and they take him off, and we... We ran. And it wasn't but two hours earlier that we were in the upper room. I was looking at him. I was looking him right in the eye saying, if everyone disowns you, Jesus, I won't. I'm with you. I love you. And I think that's what made me stop, turn around, go back. And uh, I caught a glimpse of Jesus as they were taking him to the high priest's house. Stood at the gate, and some girl comes up to me, starts pointing at me. 
starts going, you, you're with him. You're with this man that claims to be the son of God. You're one of his disciples. I felt like every eye was on me. So I just brushed her off. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. You got the wrong guy. I get my way into the courtyard and uh, it's cold. I, I try to warm up by the fire. And then there's this guy that recognizes me and he is uh, from the ear incident, you know, and starts going, get him, get him. He's with him, just arrest him, get him. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about, all right? I wasn't with him. It was easier the second time to deny him. It was some time right before morning and um, this wise guy, he comes up to me and goes, who are you kidding, all right? Who are you fooling? You're with him. I can tell by your accent. I'm like, this is just the way I talk, all right? And, and the whole night, they kept pushing him around. They kept beating him. They kept spitting on him, throwing insults at him. And I couldn't take it anymore. I had enough. I was tired of people accusing me, looking at me. And I, and I just, I said a few things that I'm not proud of, but I was like, leave him alone. You don't know what you're doing, all right? Just leave him alone. I wasn't with him. And that's when I heard the most blood-curdling sound I ever heard in my whole life. I heard that rooster crow. And at that moment, Jesus, he turns around and he looks at me. He looks at me. And his gaze, you can't escape his gaze. I mean, when his eyes are on you, you cannot escape it. And they arrested him and they took him off. I will die with you, Jesus. If, everyone, if everybody disowns you, I will die with you. What a, what a joke. I mean, what would you do? At that moment, at that time, I ran. I ran so fast. I ran so long. And you know what they did? They killed him. He's dead. The Bible tells us that as soon as Peter heard the rooster crow, he wept bitterly. So often, when we face hard times, we do exactly what Peter did. We run from God. As though we think God is going to judge, condemn, rebuke, cast out. Look at Adam and Eve. They made a mistake, they sinned, and they hid. And here Peter follows the human condition to run from God. When the lesson to be learned in this man's darkest hour of his life don't run from God in the darkest hours of your life. When logic and when fear, when everything else, when you see like his monologue said, all eyes are on you, everybody wants to see the decision you're going to make. Don't do what Peter did. And run from God. The capital mistake of Peter's life to deny Jesus Christ. Even after Jesus told him he would. Peter still followed through with it. To me, if there's anything I can learn in my own life, church is so full of imperfect people. There's nobody perfect in here, starting on this pulpit. We've all made mistakes. We've all looked at that place where we think, man, everything's lost, all is gone. There's no more hope. What recovery is there from that? But we know how that monologue left over they killed him. We know looking back at history, something happened three days after his event. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That the stone was rolled away. And Jesus Christ gloriously came from a position of being dead and defeated to alive and in control. 
And he sent a message to the world. But so importantly, church, he sent a message to Peter. Look what it says in the book of Mark. Go tell, he tells his angels. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Because here's a man that screwed up his life in one day. That made the capital mistake a human being could do to reject Jesus Christ. But upon the glorious return of Jesus, he sends a message to the world. And he says, go tell my disciples and tell the man that is weeping bitterly for messing his life up that I'm here. The restoration. Jesus Christ came with a plan for this world to not condemn, but to restore. And he exemplifies his message through this man's mistake by not condemning Peter, but by restoring him. The Bible goes on, and the, bo the book of Corinthians tells us that Peter was one of the first disciples that saw Jesus. That the disciples were one of the disciples was walking on the road to a city, and Jesus was there, and they didn't realize. And afterwards it says, and tell him that he showed himself to Simon. Jesus showed Peter. He said, Peter, I'm here. And Peter knew. Jesus was alive. In the book of John, the 21st chapter, the disciples are out fishing. They're doing what they, they go back to doing what they know to do. They haven't caught anything all night. Jesus, there's a man on the shore and they don't know it's Jesus. And he says, have you caught anything? Oh, throw your boat, throw your net to the other side. Says, We've turmoiled all night, but at your call, we'll do it. Boat's still overflowing, and Peter at that moment realizes that it's Jesus. I can just think back to this experience. He has a flashback to the Sea of Galilee when they're on the storm. And he sees Jesus on the shore. Peter's on the boat. And the Bible says that Peter puts on his coat, and he jumps into the ocean, and he swims to the shore. And there's Jesus with a fire right there on the shore. I can just imagine a cold morning foggy and misty and Jesus has a fire there and he's got some fish and Peter sits there at the feet of Jesus once again and Jesus says something to Peter in John the 21st chapter it says when they had eaten breakfast Jesus says to Simon Peter Simon son of Jonah do you love me more than these I can imagine he points down to the fish being that Peter was a fisherman being that Peter was out there on the sea fishing, doing what he knew to do. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than your life? Peter says, Lord, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And he says, feed my lamb. The third time, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter's heart is broken. He says to Jesus, Jesus, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Three times, Peter denied Jesus. Three times, Jesus challenged him to do what he was called to do. God chose Peter to be Christ's disciples. Jesus chose Peter. The Bible tells us God knew you before you were even in your mother's womb. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation, was slain before the foundations of the world. Knowing that we would exist today, Jesus chose us. And his mission was to restore the world. 
You may seem like you're at the end of your rope. You may feel like I've made too many mistakes. I've done too many bad things. There's never a chance in my life that I'll ever recover from the decisions that I've made. But here we see exemplified that Jesus three times restored Peter for his three denials in that season. And Peter, or Jesus says to Peter, there was a time when you were young and you would walk and do whatever you wanted to do. But as you grow old, people's hands will carry you to places you don't want to go. And he's beginning to tell Peter about the death that Peter will face some 35 years later from this day that will glorify the church. And here 50 days later from Peter's denial, 50 days after the day, uh, 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 the Passover feast when Peter made the choice to wreck his life through a bad decision, Peter lives the calling of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. In Acts, the second chapter, when the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit came upon them like a loud and rushing wind, and they began to speak in other languages around the, the world, and people began to say, these people are crazy, they're mad, and they're drunk. And who was it that stood up and began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? None other than the man who 50 days previous denied Jesus Christ. Every time you see Peter and John, Peter's known as the preacher. Peter helped found the churches. The church in Rome, which would become the early church, the capital or the leader position when Jerusalem fell. Peter was there, founding and building. And what Jesus said about Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church came to pass. If anything we can learn from the story that impacts me every day when I think about Peter, is that if God can use Peter, an ordinary man, if God can choose a man who was a fisherman by trade, a man who didn't grow up with an education, a man who didn't grow up with privilege, but a man who had to work for his life, if God can use Peter, a man who put his foot in his mouth, a man who made mistake after mistake, what can God do with you? What can God do with you? God has a plan. Like he had a plan for Peter. Like he had a plan for John. Like he had a plan for Paul. God has a plan for you. He wants to see you succeed. He wants to see you blessed. He wants to see you build his church. Because of men like Peter, who 35 years after Jesus rose to heaven, gave his life on a cross upside down because he was no longer worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus Christ. To die under the same emperor that, cruci or that killed Paul as well. Here's a man that built and laid the foundations of the church for you and I. If God can use Peter, what can he do with you? It starts by having that receptive and that open heart to know the voice of your shepherd. Peter was called by God to follow Christ, and he responded to the call. Peter was chosen by Jesus to know that you are chosen by God. Peter fell on his face, he was rebuked by Jesus, but he had to realize and learn the hard plan of life that despite the plans of men, God's plans are above. Peter had to learn. God didn't come to condemn. He came to restore. It's nothing that you haven't done. If you have breath in your lungs right here, right now in your life, there is nothing that you have done that has taken you so far from God that you cannot come back to what God has for you. I feel like I am a Peter. I feel like sometimes I just can't get it right. I feel like sometimes I just fall on my face when I think I've got it all. And to know that I'm not alone makes me know that I can get up tomorrow and do exactly what God has in store for me. Tonight, if you're in this place, you feel like you just, 
man, you kind of came and you just didn't know. You just were, had that uncertainty. You just needed some confirmation in your life. Maybe you just say, oh, God, seeing Peter's denial in his recount makes me just think about all the mistakes I make in my life. If that's you in this place, I want to pray for you. So I want to ask if you could just do something. I want to ask if that's you in this place and you say, man, I just need to learn from Peter. I feel like that in my own self. I feel like sometimes I just can't get it right. I just want to ask if you could. I know it's, it's, it's a bold statement, but if you could, could you just stand to your feet? Let's pray together. Let's let the Holy Spirit all over this place. There's nothing to be ashamed of. We're learning from the pillar of the church. And today, let's just pray. Go before the presence of God. Because the Bible tells us that the God is a God of comfort. Jesus says, I'll give you a comforter. His name is the Holy Spirit that will comfort you in your time of trial, in your time of need, so that someday you can comfort others. Peter, when he wrote his letter, 1 and 2 Peter, was able to instruct the church on godly conduct and forward thinking because he fell on his face over and over and over and he learned from God. And today, I believe that God wants to speak to you. I believe that God wants to move in your life. I believe that God wants to restore what you have in your life. So let's pray together. Father, I just thank you. Lord, I thank you first and foremost that your, your word says that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Lord, if there's any lesson that we can learn from your wonderful and impactful and powerful apostle Peter, who I know is with you now, oh Lord, I pray that you would just teach us the message of your grace. Lord, that where sin abounds, where our flesh nature abounds, Lord, where our mistakes elevate our sense of what we are and what we deserve, Lord, I pray that your grace, your unmerited favor, your divine ability to get the job done on our behalf would overshadow us and pour over us, God. Pray that you would speak to each and every person in this place that reaches out. Lord, we hold you faithful to your word that when, you draw, when we draw near to you, Lord, that you would draw near to us. So, Father, those that are in this place that have seeds of doubt, seeds of discouragement, hardships on their minds, Lord, I pray that you would begin to comfort them right now where they're at, Lord, to begin to speak to them like Jesus, to go tell the disciples and Peter that I love them, that I died for them, that I rose again, that where sin abounds, grace abounds, and I've covered you, I've enabled you, I've equipped you, I've given you what you need. All you got to do is stop running and start coming to God. So Lord, I pray that you would just speak to us your peace. God, I pray that you would just speak to us your presence. God, I pray that you would just begin to speak to your church. Those of us that are discouraged, those of us that are frustrated, those of us that don't know what to do next, Lord, I pray that your spirit would pour out on us. Give us that wisdom, that direction, Lord, that instruction and that encouragement that we need to know we can make it. We can do this. That we can make it to the end. That we can be successful in our Christian walks. Lord, I thank you that as we do, Lord, we will impact the world like you said of Peter. We will, you will build your church. Lord, that you would build your church, your universal church, your body on us, your faithful servants as we follow after you. Lord, teach us your will. Speak to us your calling. Lord, show us your redemptive value through Jesus Christ. To you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You can sit down. Maybe you're in this place tonight, and I'm just going to change it up. We'll do this in a moment. Maybe you're in this place tonight. You're just at the end of your rope. Today I want to just talk to you about your eternal walk and your relationship with Jesus. Because all of this restoration that Peter went through, all of these examples, all of the things that Peter learned, the lessons that he learned and the lessons that we learned revolve around one man, Jesus Christ. And if you're missing a relationship with Jesus in your life, I want to tell you, you don't have to live a life like that anymore. I want you just to look into your heart, to look into your life, just to answer this question. Would you spend eternity with God in heaven or hell if you were to die? Because how you answer that speaks volumes of your relationship with God. 
Do you know that nowhere does it say that you can think, that you can hope, that you can want, that you can wish? Nowhere does it say that because your parents told you that you're a Christian. Nowhere because you went to church, because you might have a, a, a family member who's a pastor. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're going to get to heaven because of those things. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're all right and everything's hunky-dory because you go to church, because you give into the offering plate. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've given yourself a label of Christian because you've been baptized or christened as a baby. Nowhere does it say that because you, you serve in the church and the children's of the youth ministry or you sing in the choir. Nowhere does it say that you're going to get to heaven because of those things. You can't live a life of fulfillment because you have good deeds. I heard somebody tell me one time that I got to live the good life because I don't want to I don't want to go to hell. I got to do good things. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you live a life of good deeds, that you try to help out your fellow human being, that you're going to make it with God? You know, the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. Nothing you could ever do on your own would ever make you good enough. Why? Because you can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't work for it. Your salvation. The only thing you can do is accept it through God, through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. So today I want to give you the opportunity to accept God's gift of eternal salvation and abundant life here on earth by accepting the gift of Jesus Christ through a relationship with him. See, it has nothing to do with your mental ascent or your carnal knowledge of who God is or knowing the scriptures, the words of Jesus. That's great and that's wonderful. And yeah, you can make your life better by living what Jesus said. But in order to live a life of fulfillment, in order to live a life connected to God, you've got to have a wholehearted, whole uh, life committed relationship with Jesus. It's an all or nothing relationship with God through his son, Jesus. Jesus tells a religious man of his day, you must be born again. Can't can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way. We only can do it God's way. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I'm coming back and someday when I come back, I better find you the church. Hot or cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians aren't real Christians at all. They'll be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does that mean to be lukewarm? Let's talk about that. It simply means that you've got your ups and your downs. You've got your highs and your lows. You've got your ins and your outs in your relationship with God. You know, you're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God, you're kind of riding the fence. You're doing some of your own thing, doing some of, some, of, some of God's thing. Listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough today to tell you the truth that you're not going to make it based on those pretenses. God, forgive us in American churches that we've watered the message down because we're so interested in the number of people in our seats rather than the conditions of the souls in those seats. Listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. There's no way we can earn our way, think our way, hope our way into God's heaven. Because the Bible tells us we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't do anything to rectify that. But Jesus Christ is the solution. He says, I have come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. So today I want to give you the opportunity today to accept the gift of God through Jesus Christ. The Bible calls it a gift. Like any gift, it has to be accepted. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. God's not in in heaven with a two by four waiting to whack you over the head because you've done some stupid things. Look at Peter. He loved you enough to give for you, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for your and my sin and our shame so that we could be reunited with God. And it starts by making a decision to follow God and to join into relationship with Jesus, not with our head, with our heart. Jesus says these words, if you confess him before men, he will confess you. He says, if you deny him, he will deny you. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to accept, to make that decision, to accept eternal life, to accept fulfillment, to fill the emptiness on the inside of your life with what only can fill it, Jesus. Today, I'm going to do this. I'm going to count to three. I'll go one, two, and then to count to three, I'll go three, just like that, and I'll smack my hands. And if that's you in this place, I want to ask you to do something bold. I want to ask you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing is you're, by the raising of your hand, is you're saying, man, today, I want to make that decision. I want to give God my heart. I want to give God my life. You see, I'm a man, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. Say, I don't know if I can do that, I'll be embarrassed. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were, it would be a lot better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God. God has already done everything he could to ensure your place with him in heaven by giving Jesus to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang naked on a cross. Now in return, he wants you to make the decision and to follow through with your actions. 
It's your choice. Who should raise your hands if you've never given God your heart? In just a moment, get ready. Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did this in youth or in children's or in a, in a, as a kid. Maybe you went to Harvest Crusade and you prayed that prayer once before, but you never really followed through with it. Listen, if that's you in this place, don't leave without making sure. Maybe you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. You've been doing a little bit of running from God instead of to God like Peter on that night. Stop running from God. Start running to Because we see that God wants you to run to him, to not run from him. But it starts by making that choice today. All across this auditorium, wherever you are, from the front to the back, whether you're in the family rooms or online uh, at home or in the foyer, if that's you in this place, get ready. I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, I want you to just pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You put it right back down and we'll, we'll go together from there. We'll work together from there. It starts by making that decision. Don't let anything distract you, the person you came with or anything like that. This is between you and God and you and God alone. So today I'm going to count wherever you're at. This is your moment. This is your time. This is the time of your salvation, the day when your life begins to change. And it starts by making the decision right now. Here we go. One. Two, three. Let me see your hands in the place today. One, I got you. Two, I got you. Three, I got you. Three wise people. Four, I got you back there. Five, I got you. Five wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. You should. This is your moment. This is your time. Anybody else in this place? You say, I wonder if I should. Everybody was over on this side. You guys over here, you all good? Listen, I love you enough to pressure you. You say, man, I feel like you're really kind of pushing. Yeah, don't you believe the devil's trying to get you to stop? I love you enough to tell you the truth. If that's you in this place, you got to get right with God. Quit playing games. Make this the day you go forward with your relationship with God. Anybody else? I didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? All right, well, praise God for the five, six wise people. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. You say, I want to do this. You're making that decision. Now it's time to follow through, to live it with your actions. So we're going to do that together. In a moment, we're all going to stand. If you raised your hand, or maybe you should have raised your hand, but you, you, you know you didn't and you should have. If that's you, it's not too late. Once you grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend, if you need a friend, if you came with somebody, hey, look to them and say, I'll go with you. Or say, come with me, and I want you to come meet me right here. I want to shake your hand. We want to change destinies together with you right here, right now. So if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to go. Come on, let's all stand together. If that's you in this place, come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come in the aisle, come meet me right here. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. If that's you, come on, you come. because I know that there was more people that raised their hands. And maybe because people left when they shouldn't have and they discouraged you from walking out, you're not making that decision. But listen, let me tell you the truth. You're not going to get saved because you raised your hand in the church service. You get saved by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here to do, to help you, to hold your hand through the process, to encourage you because you need it. But you got to make that decision. So they'll sing that one more time. And if that's you in this place, come on. Quit messing around. Quit playing games. Stop worrying about what everybody else thinks about you. And get out of your seat and get into the aisle. And come meet me up here. Because it's time for your life to change and you know it. And it's not going to change by just raising your hand. It's going to change by making the decision to follow through. But you've got to do it. So you guys sing that one more time. And as you do, if that's you in this place and you know that's you, you get out of your seat, you get out of your chair, and you come up here, and we're going to change destinies together. Oh, come just as you are. Don't you hear the Spirit call? If that's you, you 
come. Oh, come just as you are. Oh, come and see. Come and see. Come and live forever. Praise God, you guys came. Great job. Listen, I want to tell you something. You're not going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You know, you're really smart. You're making the best decision a human being could make. Good job. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. He's going to take you guys just right over there. You don't get saved because you raise your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus into your heart, into your life, by making him the Lord and Savior. What does that mean, Lord and Savior? How about this, the leader of your life? So he's going to lead you in a prayer, a real simple prayer. He's going to give you some free information. So when you walk out of here tonight, you say, what do I do next? I don't know. We're going to point you in the right direction. The next thing he's going to do, and the last thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back to hang out with us. We want to get you connected to a friend here at the church to teach you some things about the Word of God for just a couple of weeks, not a big commitment, to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything that God has for you. So if you just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God.